I ended up with nowhere or nothing and, you know, passed out in snowbanks, woken up by cops, you know, with a busted face, missing fingertips, nowhere to go. We were taught that you are the only one that you can rely on. Uh, that was my experience, was that you need to find a way on your own to be on top, to overcome every other person that you may come in contact with. It was all a big, a big fight, really. There wasn't a whole lot of peace. I have always known that I didn't want to be just anybody. And I've always known that I had potential, but I was pulled in two different directions from as long as I can remember, uh, feeling like I can and feeling like I'm not worthy. I don't feel like we're meant to be unhappy and drawn apart um, from ourselves like that. So my struggle has been to see how low I uh, have potential for and to come back from that. Girl. I'm just the person that doesn't just take someone's word for it. I need proof and I want to know why and, you know, I want to experience it. So that was probably a driving force just to understand. We had a hardworking family and uh, 24 acres to farm. So we all had jobs that we were pretty much individually responsible for accomplishing from a very young age. My parents had hard times in their lives that kept them pretty callous as well, very preoccupied. When we moved to Portland, I ended up getting in a fight with my mother and, and uh, basically being kicked out. She changed the locks and things like that, and uh, I was homeless. I would usually have to step over somebody here, um, which is, used to be me years ago, too. Well, I've, Lived here from basically 13 to 27 and had um, only a few legitimate apartments. Look at that. Hey. My father was living on an island in the, in the Virgin Islands. He was far, far away, but uh, I sort of became him in his solitude, being untouchable and unstoppable and alone. I was admired for my ability to survive and uh, that just sort of bolstered my hard edge living. But a lot of what I've experienced is, you know, the ultimate of war on the, on the streets. And I know, you know, it's Maine, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of rough guys here. I would see something that I thought was hard and try and be beyond that, try and be harder than that. So I often picked fights with large bikers and I always had a weapon on me of a razor or ultimately I was gonna die. I was taken advantage of where I was, you know, drugged or raped or beaten or all of these things that made me cage up even more. I was filled with shame and remorse and self-hatred. I often felt like I had no place to, uh, to, to go, nothing to live for, and uh, nothing to do about it. Um, I felt confused and confounded and, and uh, just dirty, you know. All of my friends were, were uh, gang members or out of prison, you know, all men and all out to, to get theirs out of life. They had respect for me because I was willing to do anything. And they knew that if I got based enough or if I got messed up enough that I was gonna provide some entertainment. I became pretty familiar with myself as an object of chaos. And it was at the point where they started telling me that I was too much for them. 
I needed to get some respect for life, for even for fighting. I pretty much uh, had driven myself to the point of no return, and I knew that from the absolute blackness, you know, that uh, I felt about myself and about my, my soul. I was about to push this little being off the face of the earth. You know, I felt very close to oblivion. To return from that feeling and start to change it all is somewhat of a miracle. I think that no matter how much we try to cover up our light inside, you know, it's still apparent to, to other good people. I had a friend that would say to me, Liz, the fight's over, you lost, you know. <laughs> surrender. In the end, surrender saved my life. You know, surrendering to uh, help, surrendering to love, to uh, myself, you know, to a higher power, surrendering to um, life. My ways of uh, fighting were weaker than ways of loving and accepting. I did have a boxer come into my life that helped me to realize that I was putting myself in circumstances that were unhealthy. I actually didn't know that there was boxing available in Portland, so when he took me out to that warehouse in the middle of uh, nowhere, I was uh, graciously accepted by Bob Russo and Skip. Niels really took me under his wing, actually, at first. God bless them for recognizing that I did belong there because it's not in boxing's nature, really, to allow people to stay who don't belong. Everyone doesn't stay. It doesn't matter your background. If you are boxing now, then you are a part of our family. I started going there as often as I could, just copying what the guys did. When my coach asked me if I wanted to um, compete, I said, yeah, definitely. Everyone comes in talking a lot of talk. They're gonna come in every day and they're gonna be the world champ. But that's just talk. I tell them all the time, don't tell me, show me. She got my attention because I believed in her. She showed me that she had a lot of character in there. She's very, very tough, super tough. She might be one of the toughest people overall that I've ever dealt with. She's just a non-stop punching machine. Our logo says, making champions and good citizens. This has become a tremendous citizen. I believed in her to the point that we raised money and put her through college. Uh, one time in the competition, the, the opponent's hair was everywhere. Bob says, is there a hairdresser in the house? <laughs> People told me that I should learn to respect fighting instead of just being this ball of fire, you know? That's when it really clicked and I could feel that a positive transfer of energy where somebody would say that I was punching the right way and it would mean the world to me and, you know, felt like I had really accomplished something. It's actually beneficial if I do it with purpose. <sighs> Much better. <laughs> I was the first actual female boxer at the, at the Portland Boxing Club. And this is something that really encouraged a lot of people in the first bout I could see it in their faces um, that uh, they really felt like they were experiencing something special and they felt good for me. There's probably a million reasons why Bob could have uh, asked me not to stay, but um, he didn't and I think it's because he saw that it it's, you know, was in my blood for some reason. It's, it's something that she has inside that no one gave her, she just has it. We just added, you know, a vehicle for her to get there, I guess. 
but the rest of it is she deserves all the credit for that. Her success, just being who she is. The kind of love and family that, you know, uh, Bob offered me and uh, the Portland Boxing Club offered me was uh, never found outside of boxing for me. You gotta love your mind and body before you're loving someone else. Finding happiness in somebody comes from finding happiness with yourself. So you gotta push on. Just walking uh, in those shoes, you know, is the success. Uh, seeing myself in that USA boxing uniform, you know, traveling to these competitions, being there and um, and showing my skill and on all the hard work in between, all the doing what I thought I couldn't do, you know, is more the success than winning the gold medal. But um, I do plan on winning the gold medal. <laughs> It really has been my dream for so long that it's that struggle of like, am I really doing this? Is this really me, you know? Am I okay with this? And, you know, and it's back to letting go. Yeah, it is everything that I've hoped and yeah, I am okay with it and I am gonna keep doing it because it's working. <laughs> so you set this up about where you were and now where you are. And then the last paragraph, you got to talk about the actual tattoo, what you have, okay. um, why it's important to, for you to have that covered up, yep. and how you know through traveling and, and all of the um, competition expenses, how you lack funds and would like someone yep. to donate okay. their um, okay. art, their artistic abilities to assist you. Just because as I go into these uh, camps, you know, and opportunities. I don't think that I can afford to have like a mar against me, you know, especially not worn proudly like that. Something right. that can be so easily misunderstood by trainers more than my my peers. I think you just need to sort of set up the letter of knowing. You're sort of showing that evolution. Yeah. And I think when someone reads that, that they're going to be like, wow, this I want to help this person. Homeless, tr substance abuse and I'll make suggestions and comments. Okay. And I'll send it back to you. Okay, great. And then we can tie this up and I'll print out copies tomorrow. Nice. We can sign them and we'll get, awesome. start to get them out. It might be a little late tonight because I have the, the cool. obligation. No I, won't be, I won't be looking at it until tomorrow morning. Oh, yeah, so okay, awesome. You can just yeah. do it tonight or tomorrow yeah. morning. Yeah, sweet. Right. Thank you, work. yeah. Yeah. That was such a good conversation, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. It goes a long way. Good yeah. job. All right, Carol. She deserves do it up. We'll get this taken care of. all the recognition that anyone cares to give her um, because she's back, because she was lost and she's found. And um, I will always be, always be grateful for that. She reined in all her uh, horses and got them in the right direction, whereas for a long time they were stampeding through life. And now she's, 
she's reaching a, a spot that I would have liked to at her age. I think that kind of would go for anybody's experience with their parents also. You know, they're people too. And um, no matter what happened, you know, along the road, uh, there's a lot of love there, you know. And in the end, that's a lot of acceptance um, and compassion, so. Um, but she's helped me a lot in my journey. She's been quite a teacher. She fought in the National Golden Gloves recently in Florida, and I was totally convinced that she won. They didn't give her the decision. The girl that she beat is the number one girl in the country, but also the most outstanding boxer of the past couple tournaments. She got the trophy as the most outstanding boxer. So of all those women champions, she might be probably technically the best, the one that Liz had to fight, the featherweight. And uh, I thought Liz beat her, and a lot of people did, and I think including that other girl. So it's not out of the question, the number one girl goes to the Olympics, so it's not out of the question that in, in 2012 that Liz will get by this girl by that time and be in the first Olympics for the women ever. I couldn't be more proud of Liz. In every way, she has come full circle. <laughs> this year's crop will be all gold. This year's, gold? Yeah, what are you do? this year's forecast is gold. <laughs> the fact that I can have peace in the ring is really a statement of, um, you know, the actualization of knowing that I'm okay, that, you know, uh, there's a power greater than me that actually cares enough to look out for me no matter what, and that I'm in a situation created by something greater than myself. And I'm just there to play my part and play it out and do the best I can. Um, that stillness that I feel in the ring is a gift, you know, um, and that gift comes from being grateful and being willing to, to be there as a tool of the universe. Going to get a tattoo cover up in New Jersey, which is so exciting, such a blessing, and just huge. <laughs> I've been trying to get rid of this for I don't know how many years, probably six years anyway. Um, this skinhead tattoo on my chest, which is often misrepresenting myself on my skin, Rep misrepresenting my insides on my outside. <laughs> and uh, so this is a huge opportunity to change that and I really appreciate it. So I took the ring off and I gave it back to him. And I said that if this is the way it's gonna be, then you know we can't continue on. And um, I, I certainly don't see us spending the rest of the time together, you know. Um, so he threw the ring and jumped out of bed. And um, I think, actually, maybe that's when he smashed the phone. Um, when he had grabbed me by the hands and was putting me down in the kitchen, um, I remember the towel floor feeling really bad and couldn't imagine my head being pounded off that. Uh, and actually, we bumped into the kitchen table, which had a bunch of my sister's glass, um, like, vases on it that she had been trying to sell in a yard sale, and they all fell off, so now there was broken glass all over the tile floor, and uh, I was about to be put down on that, so um, as he was putting me down, I bit <laughs> his abdomen because that was the only thing I could do, and I bit it really hard because I have a really strong jaw. Lynn drove me to the hospital. Oh. 
And at that point, my head was so huge. It was like pumpkin head. <laughs> so they did like CAT scan. I ended up calling Lisa. And letting her know that, you know, I mean, it was two weeks before USA's. That morning, I just, I stayed at work. And I kind of let myself down. order was dropped I wanted to believe that when he said he loved me that I was that he meant it that wasn't true um, not really I don't fight it I don't fight alcohol anymore I don't fight a drink anymore you know I'm uh, repelled by the idea someday I think that that whole you know accepting less than uh, mutual respect love in any form of relationship, you know, will be a repulsion to me as well, you know, but I guess that was kind of like a low, I had to hit like a bottom there, so, on the upswing, not me, <laughs> <laughs> our destination. <laughs> Off of a very busy year qualifying three-way classes for the women's first boxing in the Olympics I didn't make the team I didn't win the gold I did get to box the eventual gold medalist and six-time world champion Katie Taylor two nights in a row at her home in Ireland that was her 151st and 152nd bouts that I boxed the, the most skilled boxer pound for pound in the world Good as gold, it really was to me. And I know I have more learning to do in the sport, you know, and I'm doing that. So it's it's all tops, really. There were three girls that ended up going, you know. We did get two medals. Hopefully, you know, there's more weight classes next time that one could be mine. I had rave reviews from Ireland from the coaches that worked with me there that uh, I did better than anyone against her in the Olympics, you know. As far as overcoming adversity, which is what my whole life has prepared me for, really, and that's a uh, champion's attitude, is to just leave it, you know, and, and accept it, and um, maybe even put a positive spin on whatever the circumstance may be, because a million things could give you a reason to, to trip up, you know, and accept a, a loss. Your choice is, is to turn it around and learn from it and maybe even use that to your advantage. I have been in some sense raised by Bob Russo and, and that family there. I'm in a place where I can transfer that same kind of belief system and the same structure to the next generation of boxers. I think maybe that might be part of why he did accept me, you know. He started to see that uh, I'm willing to, to turn around and give it to somebody else the same way he would be.
Say, sister, I see you walking with your head down. Is it cause you got something on your mind? Does it feel like the world done dealt you a hand that's meant to lose? Keep getting knocked down no matter how you try. You gotta fall. <laughs> Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.